Kona Koto and a very um, warm welcome to this first learner success capability session. Uh, I'm Morgan Healy and I'm now the acting uh, deputy chief executive in the Oritstanga learner success team here at the TC. Um, and I'm going to to open us up and ground us in our mahi today. I'm going to use a quote from a book on creating data informed culture in US community colleges. Uh, and it's, it goes, if you're not having fun, you're not getting it done. This work, creating a, a data informed culture, should not be onerous. Learning about and supporting students is interesting and exciting work. And I hope that when you, for everyone who's here on the call today, uh, that you come ready to begin either your data journey or to share where you're at on that journey, uh, but more importantly, to, to be inquisitive and to ask questions. Uh, and most importantly, to have some fun doing it. Um, the TC is delighted to facilitate this session, which is an opportunity to share and learn from each other. Um, and we have a great lineup for you today. Uh, Massey and the University of Canterbury are here to share their experiences around data and technology and to create a space for some dialogue around that. Uh, so a huge thanks to Teddy, Catherine and Kayleen for taking the time to be here with us today. Uh, and also a big shout out to Veronica um, and my team for her amazing work organizing the session. Uh, for those of you who know V will know that this is driving her nuts and it has not gone exactly perfectly. Uh, and you know, all to say V, you're doing an amazing job and thank you for all the work um, from me and the team. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the importance of the Tufidia uh, Symposium that UC hosted last year. I think it's been a really important catalyst for our learner success mahi and in bringing the sector together. Uh, and we definitely look forward to 2.0 at uh, TWA later in the year. So a big shout out to them for hosting that um, opportunity. And lastly, but definitely not least, I wanted to recognize the providers who are working towards setting up um, Aotearoa's learner success community of practice. Uh, this group has really been integral to supporting the development and thinking around these sessions. So V, could I just get you to move on to the next slide for me, please? Thank you. Uh, so what are we trying to achieve with these sessions? Um, we want to help grow sector capability by providing more opportunities or platforms to bring people from across the sector together to accelerate and drive insights and learnings. Uh, we're looking to provide the opportunity for deep dives into learner success uh, capabilities via a variety of different formats. So webinars like the one we're on today, through workshops, um, online forums, symposium, like Tufitia, uh, conferences and informal sessions. And I guess we, what we really want to do is create a strong foundation for the sustainability of learner success models uh, and to set Aotearoa up to be a world leading learner centric tertiary system. So these opportunities to come together will allow us, I think, to do three primary things provide collaborative spaces uh, to encourage the free flow of ideas, uh, exchange of information, and possibly identify solutions to, to any sort of issues or problems, capture and share exciting, or capture and share existing and or new knowledge to help um, the sector improve whole of organization learner success practices, uh, and connect all of us um, who might not otherwise have had the opportunity to interact and share information and personal experiences. So hopefully a great, great opportunity um, as we go through this over the next six to 12 months. V. She has a very ambitious uh, schedule of events for, for all of us, which is super exciting. Um, and I think for us, you know, why these seven learner success capabilities are so important um, and the reason why we've chosen these to be the focus uh, is we see this, we see them as integral to developing learner centered operating uh, models. Uh, in other words, these are the things we believe providers need to get right to be good at, to give effect to learner success and to support their learners to succeed. So to kick off our capability session, we are going to focus today on data and technology. This capability focuses on making sure the right data is collected and then used in the right way by the right people at the right time. So data. This is about what sort of data you need to collect. Yeah, that one, no, I understand that's fair. 
Uh, data is really important and fundamental to understanding yeah, learners. Sorry to um, and TEOs, okay. we're, providers we're need data here. about every part of a learner's journey, from initial engagement, their enrollment, the progress that they're making throughout the study, and then that transition into employment or you know, wherever wherever else the learner is, you know, is looking to progress. So data helps you understand what helps your learners to succeed and also what may get in the way of a learner succeeding? What gets in the way of their success? Excuse me. Excuse me. Yeah. Can I just suggest that Tony mutes his microphone because I think that's what's creating the background noise. Thank you. Thanks, Kayleen. Good spotting. <laughs> so two main types of data uh, and both are really necessary. One is about learner characteristics. So these are the things that don't necessarily change about a learner, but can impact the way that they may engage in education. And then the learner engagement. So the ways the learners behave or act when you know, they're in tertiary education. And again, you know, that, that may also be impacted by the characteristics element. Um, you know, we often, particularly I know um, my predecessor, very excited about big data and predictive analytics. Um, and yes, that can be really, really important, um, but it's not just about that. Um, data can be used in a variety of different ways to help um, support and inform the decisions that you're making. Technology, it's about how are you going to collect the data and how are you going to use the insights um, that you derive from that. So this is about the tools and systems you have uh, to collect data, analyze insights, uh, and then use these insights to drive those interventions. And, you know, you guys will be familiar, way more familiar than we probably are about these, these tools or technologies. They're the likes of surveys or LMSs, SMSs, dashboards, um, as well as the systems and processes and capabilities that underpin and guide the way you use that data. So, you know, ethics and, and questions around data sovereignty. So before I leave you, uh, just one more huge, huge thanks um, to all of you for making the time to come here today. I really, really appreciate it. And I think we have around 47 participants, which is amazing. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, again, I can't say thank you enough to Massey and UC for sharing their journeys with us today and for making the time um, to, to do that. So I'm going to now hand over to Veronica, who's going to do some proper introductions. Enjoy. Namahi, thank you so much for that, Morgan. Um, and uh, likewise, just want to jump on the bandwagon and welcoming you into our um, learner success capability session today on data and technology. Um, so, kia ora koutou, ko Veronica Pritchard aho, uh, he kai mahi aho ki te amoranga, amorangi maturanga matua. Um, so, I work here at TC as a principal advisor um, in my job uh, alongside our sector group that uh, Morgan referred to is to try and create the communities of practice around learner success for us. Um, it's no job for one person, so despite having a big ambitious plan this year, um, every single one of you that's on this call and everyone else who can't be here, um, it's a job for all of us ahead. So, so I have the pleasure of introducing our special guests that are joining us um, from the sector today. Um, before I introduce them, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping just to keep our session really clear uh, for all of us. So the first thing is uh, you are being recorded. So I hope you brushed your hair and made yourself look really nice um, because the goal of our sessions is to distribute this information for others to be able to see and hear. If you didn't brush your hair, you're welcome to turn your camera off, which is totally OK as well. Uh, secondly, um, the session will, as Morgan has given us a background, we'll come straight into having the opportunity to talk with our sector colleagues. Um, often we come along to these sessions and there are presentations which are really important, but they often dominate and there's not enough time for us to be able to tell it or call it with each other. So we're going to try and keep a lot of our, our proportion of the session dedicated to the Q&A time. When we get to the Q&A time, uh, we are orderly fashioned um, folks, and so we'll pop our questions um, into the chat, and I'll just take that by order of that, um, and we'll go through that. There may be some duplicates, so I might just combine some questions, um, and then we can put our three guest speakers in the hot seat, which is going to be really fun to see. Um, and now, um, to come now to the, the most important part that for us. So I hope a lot of you guys um, a really good diligent readers because if you refer if you recall my um invitation to this included some homework um and i've got an imaginary uh, chocolate goldfish for you guys 
if you know who the speaker was um, and what he said at 32 minutes point 10 seconds, which I probably know you're not going to. Um, so Dr. Tere McGonagall Daly, which is the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Students and Global Engagement from Massey University, we had the pleasure of, of pre-recording uh, a presentation about Massey's journey around data and technology in December. This was included in your uh, invitation, so I hope you guys have had an opportunity to see that again, trying to use the time really wisely. Um, and so he he's going to um, put on an amazing wave, his most creative wave right now, because he's color coordinated. There we go, fantastic. Um, and then he will be part of our, our crew that's going to be answer, answering some questions with us. Um, we have from the UC crew, um, Professor Catherine Moran, who which is the Deputy Vice Chancellor uh, Academic from UC. Um, and we also have Kayleen Sampson, uh, who is the Program Director of Learner Success at UC. They're also going to do their most contemporary wave at you both um, to show, yep, they're, that, that they're there. Um, so without further ado, we're going to move into um, list hearing from UC because you've had the opportunity to hear from Tere. Um, and then once we've had that opportunity, we'll then open up the space for some questions, conversations and comments, which is what this is meant to be all about. So on that note, over to Kayleen uh, and Catherine. Catherine, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> that it, it, uh, you always have to start with somebody on mute. Um, kia ora koutou. It's uh, really nice to see everybody and thank you. I'm here only for a short time, but Kayleen will be here for the uh, entire time for questions. Uh, just a really high level overview from some of the um, ways we're using data and technology uh, in, in at the University of Canterbury. Um, a, a couple of ways I'm going to talk about it. Uh, there are two areas of focus, one outside the classroom, so a whole lot of support mechanisms that are enabling outside the classroom that give data both to the students and to the people supporting the students. And then I'm going to talk to you about how we're using data inside the classroom that both, um, again, provides support to students, but in more, more um, ambitiously, I guess, in some ways is um, driving some of our course development and changes to a, a, in approach to, to courses and designing courses for student success. So outside the classroom, um, there are three main uh, areas that we've focused. Um, probably the one that some of you may or may not have heard of, I know some of you have, because we've discussed it, is our analytics for course engagement. The analytics for course engagement is run through our learning management system. We use Moodle and we call it Learn. And the students, um, every activity on Learn gets a, an engagement score. So if you're just looking at Learn, it's a very low engagement score. If you're involved in a discussion, that's a very high engagement score. And um, the students, uh, the, the machine learning, it uses machine learning to evaluate um, how much engagement the students are having. The students can see their engagement relative to their cohort. So the, um, the, the machine learning does an average of, of how much students are engaging and students get their own view. They have a dashboard so they can see if they are engaging around the same amount as their as their um, cohort, which is good in both directions. Sometimes students spend too much time on one course and not enough on another. So it just gives them a sense of what is uh, some normative data for themselves. Uh, it's not performance data. It is simply engagement data. Um, but what's more uh, important, not only just the students being able to see it, but we have a, a workflow whereby the students, um, if the student disengages, uh, there's an automatic uh, message goes to the students and they get a text. Uh, and that that nudge um, for the students gets them back on board. And Kayleen has detailed data on that, but it, 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 it re-engages um, about 60% of students, not just in that one course that gets the, um, gets the the flag or the text, but all their courses, the engagement increases. So that's that's um, been been good 
data to understand. So that's how that's data for us to feedback how we use it. Uh, but also it connects the students with the advisors. So the student, the um, advisors of students don't re-engage. There's then a workflow that goes out to those people in faculties and in our in our uh, central advising team who can then reach out to the student. That's enabled in part by um, another type of technology, uh, which is D Dynamics 365, which is our uh, internal uh, CRM. And um, we have a everybody working with the student has a 360 degree view of the student. Um, so that's a very student centered and that has been helpful. And again, if, if people have questions, um, I'm sure Kayleen will be happy to answer more questions or comment on that. And lastly, um, one that's forthcoming, but we're eager to um, eager to put forward in terms of technology uh, in particular is uh, the chatbot. So looking forward, and I know some some universities have a chatbot, and we really want to get students being able to have some self-efficacy around some of the easy uh, kinds of information. One of the things we've discovered in, in um, analyzing our data, and we're finding out through our analytics for course engagement, that students are receiving a lot of information, and they are receiving it from a lot of different places. Um, and, and while a learning management system is fabulous, um, it's very easy to put people to, for people to put lots of materials for the te for the teaching staff uh, to put lots of materials, extra materials, videos, and so on and so forth. And we're finding that the students aren't quite sure how to use their energies. So there's um, there's a, there's a streamlining uh, a, a piece there inside the classroom. Um, our use of data has been particularly powerful in terms of um, changing, uh, again, course design and program design. Um, if I share one example at a very high level is our Psychology 105 uh, course, which is a first year psych course and um, has many, many students in one of our largest uh, largest courses. It feeds into the Bachelor of Arts, the Bachelor of Science, and the Bachelor of Criminal Justice. It has had stubbornly poor um, pass rates, including a, um, a a gap for our Maori and Pacific learners that um, that was was very poor. Um, in fact, in 2019, just looking at the data, we had a, a you know less than 50% pass. Uh, course completion rate for our Pacific students, for instance, and only 60% for our um, Maori students and only 72% for our for all others. So it was not it was not a course that was going well. Um, we introduced something called peer assisted learning support um, in there, which um, which was a is a uh, as, as it sounds, we we have peers working with um, working as as uh, almost like tutors, but it's very directed and in the classroom. Um, but we've also redesigned the course. We brought in uh, early assessment, so we know first up, very early on, if the students are um, either disengaging early or doing poorly early. And um, in fact. Steds in 2021, they put in two measures early. One was a self-efficacy measure for the students to know themselves. Uh, not sorry for psych for them to know themselves, and also um, a, and a test. And then that allows us to direct those students very quickly to PALS and to um, and to some of the other supports we have in place. We have. Um, uh, used this, we've we've now seen. I'll just just uh, share our um, evaluation course evaluation um, in has gone from around us. It's on a five point scale from around a three point six up to four point two five. It's continued to climb this year. Um, our PALS cohort have had uh, an enormous uh, improvement. So those students who we can who we channel into PALS, and remember, many of them are low performing students, and yet they are coming out a GPA uh, higher, a, a grade higher. But more, um, more importantly, the course completion rate has gone from um, stubbornly below seventy percent. 
um, and gradually has climbed up to 78%. And now we are seeing an 84.4% uh, course completion rate with um, our Pacific students going up to 67% course completion and 77 percent course completion for our Maori students. So what why that's important is everybody's improved, but we're actually seeing the gap closing. So it's a much bigger, uh, it's, a, it's a much greater differential. Uh, how do we use that data then? It's a very powerful tool when we go out to the rest of the um, our first year courses, which is where we're putting most of our energy at the moment. Uh, and it's a very powerful tool for us to go out and say, this is the impact of putting of good course design and development. And then we can wrap uh, and again with early assessments so we can identify early. So we've we've started that journey already. So that's our high overview. And Kayleen, you might want to, I don't know if you want to add anything or just uh, happy to take questions as part of the discussion. Maybe we should let questions drive the discussion because I mean, I think that is a good overview. So focusing on um, more conversation than presentation. So yeah. and apologies, I'll be departing early, but Kayleen will be here for the whole time. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, uh, Catherine and Kayleen. Um, so we, uh, the chat is uh, available and open now for people to pop their questions in. Um, I might kick us off with our first question just to get the ball rolling um, and then we can go from there. Um, I feel like Richard Neal will always have a question, so without putting him on the spot, he's probably going to go after me. Um, but um, come, casting our minds back to uh, Tere's presentation, one of the things that come up from there was around um, the challenge of ethics around data and technology. Um, and I wanted to just enter perhaps the first question around what, what coming back to you, Dr. Tere, uh, what do you think are the biggest ethics challenges uh, for this capability of ours? Uh, kia ora vi and, and kia ora tato. Um, that, that's, that's a really good question because it's one of those things that when you enter into the space of data and technology, it's actually the sort of question I think you need to be able to answer first is why are you collecting the data in the first place? How are you going to use it? How are people going to know how you're going to use it and how are you communicating that to them? And it really just starts to really delve into what is your purpose behind going down this route? Um, so I, I think one of the, the biggest ethical pieces that we need to consider along the way is understanding the purpose of what are you trying to do and actually are you going about it in the right way? Um, understanding the tools you might be using because some of us, and I know Kayleen and I have talked about this a few times, you know, you may use an AI, you might use a machine learning tool, um, whatever variation you may decide to utilise is understanding what does it actually do and does someone actually genuinely understand that practice as well, because you don't want to be using information that gets pumped out of a machine um, without actually understanding the context of what it's actually gone through. Um, and also the variables that it's going to be considering along the way. The third one for me is also about transparency of how do you make sure that the right people can see the right information and that includes students. Um, at Massey, we tend to try and be as transparent as possible with our students. So what we see is pretty much exactly what they see. Um, but at the end of the day, you've also got different areas of specialization as well, because if it's a self-service mechanism, um, as Catherine's mentioned, that's very different to something that's maybe a bit more proactive versus something that's maybe a little bit more specialist. Um, and, you know, to what degree have you considered that? And that also then stems into the realm of policy and, policy and procedures. So I think there's lots of things there to unpack, um, V, but hopefully that kind of gives a bit of a starting response. Maybe Kayleen wants to add to that. Um, yeah, no, I think from our perspective, we have um, really tried to start very early on and identify what are the measures we need to be gathering to be able to use that to drive the kind of change we're trying to see. So that is a, a, a real ongoing conversation. And so I think one of the things that we are in the space of doing and reflecting continually is are we gathering the right data and are we using it for the for the right um, 
for the right purpose. So, in fact, just today I had a meeting with my team to try and drill our KPIs right down to individual activity to ensure that we are capturing what we need to be able to understand whether what we're doing is working. And if it's not working, then we need to pivot and um, do something do something different. Um, what was interesting from the meeting I had today um, with my team was that I've recognised that there's still a bunch of things we're not capturing. Um, we say we could measure it by doing X, but then we also understand that we don't have that. And is that something we pick up through survey or is that something that's secondary data source or is that something um, we have to go out and build a way of capturing? So as we grow and evolve through the things we're delivering, we are finding lots of different mechanisms um, are either required or not. I mean, existent, non-existent, redundant. I mean, it is a continuous journey. Mm, yeah, which it links to Paki Manuko's question, which is the way in which um, data gets collected. So uh, there's a question here, as a Māori Pacific person, how do we ensure the integrity tika matipono tapu of the taonga? Um, so I might go come back to you, Kayleen, to kick us off and then Ted, if you want to add to. Okay, so um, you are going to have to translate the question. Sure. Uh, Paki, uh, are you online? Maybe I could come to you, Anthony. Do you mind just helping us out with um, English translations of that question? Kelda, I'm, I'm online. Oh, hi. Paki's here. Wonderful. Thank you. Kelda, I'm, I'm a lecturer at Te Wananga Aotearoa. Um, um, tika mete pono, um, the the trust and the truth of the integrity of the information given. Um, tapu, the sacredness of the tongue of the gift that it's seen as a gift. Um, it's people's um, personal information. How do we ensure it remains sacred? Um, that it doesn't just become another data point in the scheme of things. So how do we ensure um, that that it is, remains a tonga? And the last part of that is how do we then communicate that back so that people know it, it's remained a tonga and it is still sacred? Yeah, cool. that that is a good um, question. Thank you, Paki. Um, University of Canterbury has committed um, to work with our treaty partners to ensure that everything we do, we do with a, a, a mindfulness to our, not our obligation, but our desire to work um, with our treaty partners in the right way. In terms of the work with our students, we are... Um, continually folding our findings back to students um, in every way that we can. It is a work in progress and it is not always easy to um, ensure that students hear or are able to access um, the information that we do feed back to them. Part of what we've done with ACE in, to, in order to be transparent with our students is to give them more and more information on their own dashboards about, I mean, it's an example of a data point that we gather that has a living relevance to our students because, um, you know, the, the way they engage that data is captured and oftentimes our, um, our ACE coordinator is um, receiving communications from students that say, oh, you know, thanks for letting me know or, um, oh, you've got that wrong, oh, we were doing such and such. So And so it creates a bit of a dialogue between our coordinating team and our students periodically. Um, I guess... I guess it is a work in progress and I think it's a space where we can all learn. I wouldn't at all say that we're perfect, but I do believe with our, our relationship with our treaty partner, Naitu Ariri, we are um, committed to an ongoing dialogue and really um, observing what we do with integrity to ensure, um, to your point, Paki, that we get it right. Catherine, do you want to add to that? Ah, she might have gone, has she? She may have had to have gone. If, if I can add to that from a, a massive perspective, because kia ora paki for the question. 
um, in Papai, it's a, a really important area I think that we all need to be considering along the way. Um, at Messi, we do make a very conscious effort that as we collect students data, um, they have um, clear knowledge of how it's going to be used and why. Um, and it's not just a tick box you know, that you fill out on an application form, it's actually one of those discussions that they actually have with people. Um, we also have a number of services on campus that are designed by Māori for Māori and designed by Pacific for Pacific, and uh, they are also very, very clear around um, how they can access that data and, and utilise it. I think one of the big questions for me in the collection of data um, uh, for all students is actually about making sure that it's not viewed as this is being used from a deficit point of view of we are trying to highlight something wrong. Um, uh, because in actual fact, we try and look at it in the completely opposite view because a lot of our analytics work by all means might show areas where um, if the student just knew about their current situation, you know, that would actually just help them just by knowing that one nugget of knowledge. But all the way through to the other point where we have students that are on the verge of getting a first class honours but they just don't know it. And so how do we just let them know in advance of them doing their final exam? Um, so it is about making sure that we do have that corridor up front. We make sure that we're very open and honest. And we also work with our community. So we have a Māori data governance group um, that work with us really closely around how we do that. Um, we, we, funny enough, don't have that on the Pacific side. So I think your question is quite relevant because I've I've actually just not thought of that. That's probably my, my fault. Um, but it is one of those areas that we do try and make sure that when data is shared with the university that we are using it in the most appropriate way. Fantastic. So Richard, you had your hand up. If others would like to comment, please just indicate with your hand up. Um, but it was only a matter of time, so go for it, Richard. Um, oh, kia ora. I don't think I'll add insight, but I'll, I'll add complexity as, a, as an organisation that's also collecting scrolls of data. I mean, I, you can often be concerned about, you know, um, and I'll use this word coyly, you know, what would it be like for a community to understand that it's a risk, a risk group? You know, it's actually part of a risk portfolio. That's a pretty sensitive thing to talk about. And, and I think the languaging and the intention is really important. Other things that we run into is just collecting raw data like engagement, but there's, uh, you know, with the CRM, there's a lot of notes from service areas and, um, you know, different groups, like it could be counselling or it could be health or it could be disabilities. There are certain no-go areas where legislatively you have to be very, very careful about the utilisation of that data. But it's also incredibly rich. If you know that, a, that, that a, if a student is um, experiencing a clustered series of challenges, mm -hmm. that, that actually adds to your concept of how much... Um, support and intensity you need to put around them. So there's a real trade-off between being coy about putting that in a place where you can use it, and the, and, the, and not using it at all, and watching that student potentially um, fall away where we may have been able to do that. So that's been quite a challenge, even with our own staff sharing previously held databases. That's been quite a challenge to get us to to share that together. If you can put the benefits together. One interesting example is, you know, because we're entering in data into our CRM, uh, we, we have a hardship um, uh, 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 process which has a limited cap and then it runs out. Um, and obviously this year it's been heavily impacted by Alfano and Hawke's Bay and um, over 50% of the users of that hardship around are Māori at Victoria, but they're only about 14% of the population. So by capping that out and saying that there's no more putia left, the, the most disaffected parties will actually be these, um, you know, these, these Māori groups. And we now know that because we're collecting um, that data in a really uh, uh, commonly understood place, and that's enabling us to adjust our policy. So it's one of those difficult questions where the benefits are there, but also the potential impact and morale and a feeling of self-worth is also there. And I would have to say it's pretty uh, new territory um, uh, uh, for organisations. So not an answer, but just it gets even more complicated the further you go. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Richard. Um... I'm going to leave the space open a little bit. OK, we've got Anthony coming through. Um, Anthony, I'm going to let you answer your question in person because you're a lot more lively in person than <laughs> your texts. So go for it, bro. 
Well, I don't know how to take that comment, actually, V. That, that looks pretty lively to me. I've got commas and a whole bunch of words in there. I appreciate that. Um, so, so the comment was made, um, Kayleen, just around the in-class usage of data insights and then the design of the program. I'm, I'm keen to hear um, actual examples from either the, the program design, whether it's a learning outcome or a change in an activity or the actual interventions that happened in a class with the tutor, the lecturer or Kaiafina support staff. Um, yeah, if you just had an, an example of each would be super helpful to see what came yeah. about from your insight. Yeah. So one of the things that our ACE dashboard's enabling us to see is every activity that is in Moodle or Learn as we call it. So every activity in Learn, we can immediately see what proportion of students have looked at it. Um, the, the, um, the rate of uptake or the rate of submission or, uh, you know, all of the data around anything that exists in the LMS. So when we were looking at Psych 105 to try and understand why our pass rates were so small, it became really transparent that there was a whole bunch of legacy documents, content creep, um, there's a whole lot of stuff going on in that course that was actually running counter to what is required in a good um, learning and teaching environment. So um, that was one example of where we got in the back end, had a look what ACE was producing, our analytics for course engagement, um, and were able to say, look, you've got this thing in here, nobody's looking at it, or only 10% of your students are looking at it. Do you really need to busy the platform by having it? Is it an essential document? Because if it's essential, whatever's happening in the teaching space or the learning space is not driving up engagement with that document. So you need to start to think about the way you utilise the learning management system as a part of teaching. So that was one of the first places where we started to look at the classroom in terms of um, learner engagement, um, remembering that ACE is all about engagement. There is nothing about outcome in our ACE scores, and we do that deliberately because we don't want students to feel like we're judging their ability. We want to encourage them to engage because we know engagement is a, a precursor to success. You've got to be engaged to be successful. In other ways, we've then taken um, just a uh, an analog Brillo pad to the way the teaching was occurring and combine that with what was happening in the learning management um, um, system. So we've um, put together now that run across and we're working across a bunch of our hundred level courses to replicate this experience. But we've put together now a program called Taipapaki, which is around looking at waves of change through the um, uh, through the learning, so the, the course design. So we're taking a massive redesign to our courses. I mean, too many teaching staff, too much baton teaching, um, you know, too many um, useless things in the learning management system, all well intended, but actually really taking an analog approach to saying, this is what the data says around what people are doing with what you thought was a good course. This is what needs to sit in a good course. Let's put those two things together. The third way in which we've really brought about change, and again, I'll use Psych 105 as a, uh, an example, is that we got very early low stakes information from students at the end of week one. And at the end of week one, we knew who had low self-efficacy because we asked them. And I mean, admittedly, psychology is great. They love psychometrics. So they were right down with, you know, a 10 point psychometric test on self-efficacy. but. What we did with that is we got we got um, those students with low self-efficacy. Then we ran a week one quiz on what you've what you've got so far, and just very much an orientation style of quiz. And between those students that either that had low self-efficacy or were very low on that original quiz. We used that early assessment, and it was, I mean, it was like a 4% quiz or something, to immediately drive out invitation to attend our peer assisted learning support. So we were using data points in the way Richard was talking before about identifying risk and then offering up to those students come into our peer assisted learning support. Now, some of those students did it, and some of them didn't come. 
our subsequent analysis where we um, we created a match pair analysis. So we compared all of those students that came to Pounce with an equivalent cohort who had equal low self-efficacy, so it wasn't statistically significantly different, and who also performed, performed poorly on the quiz, and who also had a match across demographics of age, socioeconomic status, school decile, um, gender, program of enrolment. So we matched. We had the closest match we could create a, a, a post-creation of a control group. And what we found was significant increases in academic performance for those students who were able to come along to PALS. So we used data to tell us who should be invited into the intervention. And now we're using data at the other end to say to our next class where we're beginning to do this intervention work, you bring together this triumvirate of course redesign, le um, so course redesign with academics, the learning management system redesign and support through peer assisted learning support, and we can produce significantly better academic performance and course pass rate for those students that um, most need it. Does that answer your question, um, Anthony? Great. Fantastic. All right, thank you. Did you want to add anything, Teddy, or Lisa? Let's um, put up his hand. I'll let Teddy go, and then Lisa Lee can go next. Yeah, the, the only thing I'd probably add to it, and I'm going to go and rewind quite a bit, actually, because this is a question I stole from Kayleen and Catherine um, a long, long time ago. But we, our, our approach to looking at some of our academic offer was actually to go out to our academic community and just say, look, have we got something wrong in the way that we do things? Because if our students are studying with us, you know, why do we always look towards the student? And in actual fact, we need to look at ourselves to say, what can we do that's better? And across all of our five colleges, all of our colleges put their hand up and said, yes, we think we are the problem. Um, so that was our inroad into looking at our academic provision. And that was our inroad in terms of us really exploring what can we do across our academic offer in order to make a difference. So when we started that part of the process, we actually identified about 30 um, which we call high performance courses um, across the university because these are courses that have quite large volumes um, and in actual fact if we can get those courses performing really really well it actually mm -hmm. has a really positive impact on students overall um, and that was everything from uh, looking at the course content the way it was taught the mode of delivery um, it was actually also looking a little bit at the academic teams that were teaching within the programs mm -hmm. and if they were well supported. It looked at their own skills because we have some fantastic researchers. Doesn't always mean that they're fantastic teachers. Just saying, I'm saying that in a very open forum here. Um, but at the same time, it's also about us looking at things like, you know, assessment. The one example I could probably give is um, we had one of our um, mathematics papers in first year that had traditionally always been in paper, so you'd actually write out all the formulas and you do the exams as per normal. Um, during COVID, everything obviously moved online and it was one of the courses that actually really struggled. And it was a really simple case of we had designed an assessment that tried to replicate what we did in a lecture hall, where in actual fact, students didn't know how to write a formula using free typing. So, you know, that, that's a really clear flaw on our part and that we then had to reflect on in order to get that right in future. So that, that's just a very practical example of the way that we've tried to really review some of our really significant courses and make sure that they are actually fit for purpose so that we are not creating any internal barriers for a student to be successful. Mm, fantastic. Um, I'm going to invite the lovely Sarah to ask her question um, from our Auditor Tanga team. Um, Richard, were you just going to comment on that um, what today and Kayleen just shared before I moved to Sarah? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, you listen, to, be, to, to be controversial at a previous life at a previous institution that shall not be named, um, you can also use that data to go, do we have at-risk teaching staff? You know, um, but nobody thinks of it that way. Like, you know, it's it's the concept, or well, that must be the student's fault, therefore we couldn't possibly have that. In, in, in some provisional look at that data, you know, there were some really simple, quite um, uh, commonsensical scenarios where new lecturers that had never had previous experience were, were you know, having slight difficulties with classes. You know, this this promoted ideas about not putting, you know, putting them in with extra support, not overloading that class, not, potentially if you've got the capability, not putting too much risk 
in, in, in their first cohort. So it's not just students, it, 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 it could be us, and it could be for very, very good reasons, do you know, uh, um, that you could do that, maybe particular areas, I, I know in some of the um, uh, uh, vocational sector with massive high levels of turnover, do you know, that was another one where you just couldn't get momentum with the pedagogical practice um, as opposed to that. So once you start looking at the data, if you flip it, and then start having, well, let's look at the LMS engagement from students, but let's have a look at our lecture engagement in LMS and see if that's got anything to um, tell us. And often it's pretty interesting. Um, just putting it out there. Gary's going to be controversial. <laughs> <laughs> well, let the record stand that I was correct of Richard. So on to you, Sarah. <laughs> Oh, Kira, Richard, um, there was actually a number of very interesting sessions looking at exactly that at a conference that um, Robin Longhurst and some of the others of us um, attended recently around teaching pedagogy and how it, it, it was really about how we support faculty, particularly those maybe coming through the vocational space who aren't trained teachers. How do we really support them and make sure that they've got the skills they need to learn, not on, um, to teach not only those pedagogical teaching skills, but um, for the teaching, but how they can create a culturally safe classroom and um, all those kind of things. So, I mean, you, all of your institutions will have your own practices for improving teaching outcomes and there's all sorts of networks globally and that kind of thing. But I think that's a really good point, Richard. Um, you know, sometimes we throw our all our staff and all our institutions out to the wolves almost and go fly and then they go, I don't know how. So thanks for that. Um, I've actually got a really detailed question, Kayleen, but it's been kicking around my mind for a while. You will have seen it in the chat. So um, when we hear these examples, of students looking at engagement, um, looking at whether their levels of engagement are correct or are, are, are on par, what happens for an institution if you actually end up with a course with really low engagement levels? So I guess I'm asking, how do you use those systems you've described to us to drive maybe actually, oh gosh, actually, and I, it plays to Richard's point, you know, how, how I guess, how is UC and Terry maybe how are Massey using the LMS CMS system to drive what Richard has suggested, like where you can come back and see actually this is not about learner engagement, this is about, can, can you describe that feedback mechanism for us? Mm, mm. So um, we have been on a bit of a journey for the last um, few months, building for each faculty a very, a, a, a sort of a triangulation of the data points that we have that could signal teaching um, teaching quality or, 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 well, no, actually, we're shifting from teaching quality at UC to squarely focus on student success because if the students aren't succeeding, then we do have to go in and deal with um, teaching quality issues. So... Yeah. What we have done, and it's a bit like Tere was talking about targeting um, um, those those courses that can uh, touch across um, a, a lot of students. And in fact, as a sidebar, we ran PALS in nine courses last year, our peer assisted learning support in nine courses at 100 level, and we were able to reach 89% of our first year students. Now, I don't mean 89% of our first year students participated, but it was made available to 89% of our, percent of our first year students just by nine um, courses. So, what we've done is use that model and say which courses are key courses or courses that predict longer term outcomes at year um, at, at progress to graduation. And we, we took a decade of data to do that piece of work and to say, well, look, if you've got if you're in Psychology 105 and if you get a B in Psych 105, you are 30 percent more likely to progress to graduation than if you get a C. So then we're starting to think, well, we need to take meaningful um, action to uh, step step student performance within those courses. So. We looked at those courses that have a good predictors of outcome, and we looked at courses that our students are required to do. And we agglomerated that data, or I mean not agglomerated, we pulled data together on those courses and across each faculty, it's probably, and we're, I'm talking 100 level at this stage, but across each faculty, there's probably about 10 or so courses that we would call our key courses that, that matter because they either predict progress to graduation or they are required 
to progress in that degree. So by virtue, if you don't pass that course, then you're not um, you're not progressing through your program. And what we've done there is then taken a whole bunch of data, like our student evaluation of teaching data, our quality indicator in learning and teaching metrics that predict engagement and teaching quality. And we've pulled those metrics together. And we've also got our pass rates as reported to the TEC pass rates. So not our, um, so our course completion rates, so our single data return completion rates. And we've made this kind of one page that we're taking out to each of our faculty. Now, what we've done there is we've set a challenge to change those completion outcomes using those metrics as stimulus or lever or levers around improving teaching quality, around improving student engagement. And so there's a bunch of metrics in there that enable us to leverage to, to bring up those um, course completion rates, because if you don't complete the courses, you don't complete the degree. It's about getting right back to the, the, the getting right back to basics. To answer your question, I know it's a long winded answer, but to answer your question, Sarah, we've now got teaching development staff assigned to each of those faculty and it's becoming their KPIs to bring about change through the teaching development work they, they do. And of course, that is all about building relationships um, with those uh, teachers in those courses. And it's about brave conversations with executive deans. Do you have the right people standing up in front of these key courses? Now, we had to have that conversation in Psych 105 and it wasn't easy. We ended up you know, when you chop the vegetables and you put everything into the compost and you start again, we had a bit of a go about what goes in the cooking pot and what goes into the compost to figure out what were the right ingredients from a teaching perspective to enable us to bring about those changes. So there's a very long winded answer, but it's a long winded process. It's quite complex what we're trying to do in that classroom space. Peter, did you want to add anything from Messi's perspective? Uh, I, I'm just doing what Kayleen's doing. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> we, we are doing something I'll have very what similar. she's having. <laughs> yeah, we, we are doing something very similar. We, we obviously just call them slightly different names. So, so what Kayleen's described is what we would call our course incubator. Um, and that's basically where we use the data to help inform the way that we recreate or revive um, or, or review the, the course itself. Um, but I guess it's all based on the similar principles that, that Kayleen's mentioned. In addition to that, we also have our own teaching academy, and I'm sure um, all institutions would have something similar where it is the train the trainer um, type of approach, where it is about professionalising the way that our academics teach. They are fantastic researchers and fantastic in their respective field, but it is about making sure that they can also teach, especially teach the complexity of our student populations. Um, and I say this from the point of view of, you know, Massey's average age is in its sort of early 30s. Um, so we don't have that traditional school lever um, uh, demographic at, at Massey and it just adds to levels of complexity. The other side of it, though, is that we always balance out what we do with the academic staff with what we do with students. So um, alongside all of our course incubators, we have what we call student achievement coaches. And that also, again, works alongside students to, again, look at ways that we can increase participation. Wonderful. I'm just going to. Um comfortably sit in the uh, silence a little bit just to open up the space um, in case other people might have a few questions or comments that they'd like to make or ask. Right, well, that was really comfortable. Fantastic. Um, I do have one question that I just wanted to cover off, and we kind of perhaps sort of touched on it, but it has been quite a significant event that's occurred in our life, and that has been COVID. Um, and I know that there are a few providers, um, you know, that are kind of specialising in, in, in using their data and technology to really tell what happened for us and our learners during that time. Um, so I want to put to Kayleen and Tere and perhaps any other providers that are here. Are you waving at me, Richard? Oh, no, no, you're rubbing. Your, sorry, <laughs> I thought you were like, oh, gee, I've given you a lot of opportunities to talk. Um, I wanted to put to Ted and Kayleen, um, what has the impact of COVID been on uh, this capability for you as an institution? Um, and if there are others who are listening, I'd put that question to you too. And if you're brave enough, I'd love to hear from you, uh, your experiences in that regard. So I'll start with you, Ted, and go over to Kayleen. 
Uh, kia ora, v. Um, I would say the impact of COVID has been really multifaceted, and that's my generic way of saying complicated. Um, because what COVID really meant for us, and, and I say this, sorry, I should have premised this as well. I joined Massey in November 2019, so literally about two months before COVID really kicked off. So my introduction to university was two months of summer holiday and then um, going into an academic year of not actually seeing the students which you would have expected to have seen. Um, what COVID did, though, is it made us really explore some of this work faster. So it really accelerated the pace of change when we looked at data. Um, it also, dare I say, made some of it easier from the point of view of we became very reliant on a digital footprint um, and digital footprint being perhaps a little bit easier for us to follow um, as an institution. Where there were issues though along the way, and this is where I think this, this sort of the ethics side was as we were accelerating, it's we did get to a point at Massey where we were probably accelerating a little bit faster than the way we were bringing people with us, particularly our students. And so we consciously made an effort to slow down at the end of 2020 in order to make sure that we, we caught everyone else up with us. And so we did our major launch in 2021. Um, but also it was around making sure that as we build um, the data and analytics tools that we were using, that we weren't just focusing on those that only had a digital footprint which is one of the reasons why, and again, um, for those of you that we're at Tufetia, um, you know, one of my big things is about making sure that people are the core focus of the data um, and that data is only what data pumps out. It, you have to have a person to interpret it. You have to have a person that tells a story behind it. You have to have a person that really uses it. Um, and it's making sure that we never lose that people side of, of what, the way that we need to be working. Um, because again, I'm sure others um, had exactly the same situation too, that COVID also highlighted for us really early on equity issues. And I say equity issues from the point of view that Massey only took a few days to transition majority of our students online when COVID first kicked off. Um, and we just assumed everyone would be fine. And then as soon as we did our welfare calls, and yes, we started to capture details from the welfare calls, um, one of the clear things that popped out of that was we assume everyone have a computer. We assume everyone has Wi-Fi. We assume all these things that you just expect, let alone there may be a computer in the household, but they might be living with their whānau again, or it might be that they're living with, you know, a whole bunch of other people that perhaps are being really loud and, and whatever. And so we needed to make sure that we stopped making lots of assumptions and actually worked with the facts and made sure that we responded to the facts as quickly as possible. Um, so, yeah, so that, that's probably my my quick response. Do you want my comment now, Veronica? Oh, okay. yes, Kayleen, go for it. <laughs> okay, I was waiting for you to say something. <laughs> go, Kayleen, um, go for it. COVID actually did two things for us. It sped us up in some stuff and slowed us down in others. Um, because everybody was suddenly on online, it propelled some of our development because we got a lot of data quickly for our analytics project so so that was good um but it did slow us down um with respect to and and again the assumptions like Tede has um um rightly pointed out i mean we just assumed yep everybody off you go go online and <laughs> and it really was not um i mean we had to run a whole um interference on um uh, devices and you know access to Wi-Fi and and so in some senses it 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 disproportionately impacted some of our students over others. Um, I think as well COVID and I'm sure everybody will not in agreement that was the most fatiguing year to be trying to work in education um, and so coming back from there and asking our staff to get on board through what's what is an ongoing change leadership activity around our commitment to student success um, has been a challenge. So, I mean, we did in some ways, we got some benefits, we got some great data and, you know, we were able to drive some of our, I mean, we were really blessed with having ACE in place so we could immediately see who was disengaging and it was great. Um, and in fact, it was a population level at some 
in some ways because everybody was online. You know, we didn't even have to account for those that might have otherwise been in lecture. So in some senses that was good, but in other ways I think the fatiguing aspect of COVID hasn't hasn't helped us with this ongoing student success piece because people are really tired in the sector after that. It's been exhausting. Yeah, absolutely agree. Um, I'm about to ask my last question. I, I did just want to check in that I wasn't taking up all the airtime um, and somebody uh, sitting in this group might be like, Veronica, you didn't give me a turn. Um, so I just want to check that we're OK to move into the last question, which will then close us off, um, give you guys back a, a little bit more time. Um, and if you could just nod at me, uh, that'd be fantastic. If, if, if I'm, yeah, it's that kind of forever hold your peace moment at the wedding. We're at that part. OK, right. Wonderful. OK, so my last questions to you, Teddy, Kayleen and yourself, Morgan, um, as our speakers today is if we had an alien apocalypse tomorrow and you had one opportunity to give one message around this capability around data and technology, what would that message be? Because, of course, this would be the most important thing if an apocalypse happened, right? So um, I'll come first to you, Morgan, uh, and we'll go then to Kayleen and Tede, and you won't need me to introduce yourselves to those points. You can go for it. So over to you, Morgan. Oh, that's a, a fascinating question, Veronica. Um, I guess it, for me, it would be about how do you how do you use your data and technology in the apocalypse to, I guess, support uh, your communities to to survive and to in in that mech, you know in that space to thrive. So I think. Yeah, you know, bringing back what I've, you know, what we've heard today is the is the real importance of learners being at the center of that and using the data in a way that enables them to make some conscious choices and then, you know, enables the providers to wrap some really impressive support around them in order to to keep them focused on their journey. Um, so I think for me, it's about, you know, how collectively we can come together in an apocalyptic situation to to make sure we can you know stay on the pathway uh, and you know try as much as we can to to thrive. I will say I'm that person. I don't want to ruin the road for anybody. Uh, I'm Charlie Theron. That's out. Like I'm out. I'm just not interested in a post-apocalyptic world. So um, <laughs> so thanks, Faye, for that question. I think I'm a bit like Morgan. Um, uh, the last thing on my mind would be student success in a post. I'm just being honest. Um, no, look, I think really, I guess where you're getting to with the question, Veronica, is what is that one essential thing that we need to know about? And I guess for me, data is just data. It's just an, it's just data. In fact, the work in any of this, if you want to use data to drive change and you want to use data to bring organisational shift, it's actually about change leadership and it's how you work with people and it's how you bring people along on that journey so that the data, I mean, the data is your way in, particularly in um, an educational setting where data is revered, it's your way in. But in the end, it's only an opening of the door and what really works is what works because we have people at the centre. So, yeah, I'll just say that. Cool. Um, and sorry, I, I don't think I get one point because I'm going to do seven, um, but that's more because I'm going to repeat something that I said at Tufetia. Um, so for those of you that were there, I apologise. I'm repeating a slide because I literally had to quickly find it. Um, but one of the favourite things I, I think of when I think of, um, you know, what would this look like? if there was this massive change and what sort of advice would I give someone? And for me, it comes down to, to six overarching pieces, which is use human insight to frame the problem. And it, that touches on exactly what Kayleen was saying. Data is just data. It's not going to solve anything just by looking at data. Remember that bigger is not always better. And that's, you know, you don't have to have huge data sets in order to solve a problem. Know that everyone's lying as well because data only tells you what they tell you or what, what actually happens. It doesn't mean that that's actually correct. So I, maybe that's the cynic in me as well, that you know you always have to challenge your own data along the way. Understand that context is everything because we've just gone through COVID. So the results that we see during that sort of a period of time is not going to match the historical trend for the last 10 years, that sort of thing. 
embrace the idea that data forces us to abandon stereotypes. Data itself doesn't have stereotypes, it's only the way that we interpret it, and realise that a robot never told a great story. And that's really about us always making sure that we can clearly narrate what we do. Because I think that was going to be my, my seventh item of um, when uh, a lot of the work that we've done in the data and technology space has been working hand in hand with some of our academics. Um, and in actual fact, I've been working with um, one of our lead academics on this, who's um, uh, Professor Teo Sosniak, and he's just about to publish a paper called Beyond Predictive Learning Analytics or Analytic Modeling, an into explainable artificial intelligence with prescriptive analytics and chat GPT. And I'm sure you've all come across that one recently, but it's really about utilizing some of those tools to be able to say, well, actually, could that support us creating a narrative around it? Again, it's not going to be perfect or correct, but it allows, at least allows us to maybe take that next step past a chatbot or past uh, a way of, has, of us have, being able to try and interpret things that perhaps we won't necessarily see, but uh, by them triggering it, it might be able to be a conversation that can then be had. Um, but I think, you know, as we go into the future, there's going to be some really fascinating things in this space and we just need to be ready for it. Fantastic. Um, I think I speak on behalf of all of us who are on the call, um, Dr. Tere and Kayleen and Professor Catherine Moran, who's had to leave early from UC, uh, as well as Morgan, who shared earlier. Um, thank you uh, very much for your insights, uh, the information that you've bravely and courageously shared. Um, I, you know, I, I'd also like to thank everyone who's come along to this session. Thank you for your patience with some of our IT issues earlier. Um, I think we got there in the end. Um, and as you and Morgan alluded to, this is the first of many of sessions that we're hoping to deliver around the capabilities, all with different formats, different types of sessions, design, different focuses. And so if there are any of you who are interested in particular capabilities and you'd like to chat to us about potentially putting a context that might be really, you feel might be really important, uh, please get in touch with uh, myself or Morgan, uh, mainly myself because Morgan is our newly appointed DCE and so she's quite, <laughs> quite busy. Um, but uh, please do uh, reach out to us. Um, but thank you so much to our wonderful guest speakers today and um, here for your um, pearls of wisdom. Um, I also wanted to also acknowledge, as Morgan did, our sector group uh, that we've been working alongside. So I know the Te Wananga Aotearoa Fano are on. So Deva, Teresa, and Anthony, who's gone. Thank you guys. You see Kayleen, as always, awesome. Uh, to our Te Hiringa Waka crew as well, Richard, um, Angela, and Heather. Thank you so much. Um, and Te Pukinga, I know Warwick was on the call as well. So um, is, is that you raising your hand, Morgan? No? Okay. Um, and finally, uh, too, is I just wanted to thank um, our own uh, TEC Audita Tanga team who are on um, line as well. So Sarah, Stuart, Lee Sally, um, and ultimately Morgan for really supporting the vision behind this work. Um, moving forward, um, as said, uh, the recording we will edit. Um, we'll then figure out how we will disseminate this information. Um, <laughs> uh, and then we'll look to... Um, get in touch with our next sessions that we've had. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. I hope you got something useful out of this. Um, enjoy your days. Take care of yourselves. Be safe out there. And thank you once again. Take care, everyone. <laughs>